That's a clown question, bro. So I'm gonna kick some gun. He gets on base. Just a bit outside. I'm not the type of player that's gonna be Johnny Hustle. And if you don't want me to watch the ball, you can go get it out of the ocean. And welcome to Above Replacement Radio, where we're talking baseball kind of whenever. I am your host, Chris Gianta. Over there on the other side of the screen is Daniel Curran. How you doing, Daniel? Chris, uh, I am fresh off a, uh, a a baseball draft win uh, between you, myself, and a couple uh, friends of ours. It's not on the record, but uh, we did a draft today, and I came out victorious, and I'm proud of it. Uh, yeah, we, you know, I, I, I was... <laughs> Today I, I woke up very late. I was I was up uh, doing a lot of Lefty Grove r- research, and uh, I woke up past one p.m. and uh, eventually I had to shower. And uh, I was in the shower. I get a call from uh, and it's a group chat with Daniel and our our friend Nico, guest of the program, uh, as you yeah. may have remembered. Middlebrooks Middle Middlebrooks Mania episode fifty one was uh, was a guest. And uh, I was like, hmm, this must be because we've talked about having drafts before. But we're going to have one on this yeah, podcast soon. Yeah, eventually. Yeah, a little sneak preview. We're probably going to be doing an all time draft with uh, three, of, three of our good friends. It'll be a fun time. And it'll probably be it'll be a nice uh, homage to the history series because, yeah. you know, we've learned we've learned quite a bit. Um, and yeah, eventually I pick up, it's like, they just say, we're doing an impromptu, uh, current player draft. And I was very unprepared. Uh, I end short, long story short, I ended up finishing in third out of four. And, uh, I understand that I was very, I was very unprepared. I had, I was just thinking of just names going through my head. I missed a couple, but, um, you know, it, it's, it only sets up for the comeback. Yeah, it does. I mean, I got I got a target on my back now when we go into the all time draft. So I definitely got to get my research done. I got to start now. I mean, there's I mean, I can't I can't give this up. So, yeah. So, you know, history might be delayed next week. We're, we got to prep for the all time draft here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we might we not might not be able to do it. But yeah, it was a it was a fun thing to do uh, on a, for for a college kid in winter break. Um, but yeah. Yeah, it. I finished in third. Daniel finished in first, according to our neutral friend, uh, Rob. And uh, but anyway, we will at some point be doing an all-time draft, and uh, someone that will probably be going in the in this all-time draft, and it'll probably he'll probably be selected by one of us. Definitely, is, uh, Lefty Grove, uh, who uh, who is on the list for the for the uh above replacement radio history series um yeah he lefty grove he was one of the first great pitchers of the of the live ball era you know the dead ball era had passed on and now it was a very offensive game here in the 19, late 1920s uh early 1930s especially in the american league which was where lefty grove pitched and especially in uh shy park and fenway park which was you know his home his home ballpark but he uh you know he fought through all that he was one of the most dominant pitchers of his time and uh, we're going to be talking about him this episode so daniel if you could let's get into uh how lefty grove grew up so he was born as robert moses grove in lona coning maryland and this is such a great upbringing story for a for like a 1930s baseball player. Uh, I expected nothing less than this. His father and brother uh, had him work in the coal mines, but he quit after two weeks. I don't blame him. I probably would have done the same thing. And uh, he instead grew up working on spinning spools to make silk thread. Uh, and he was an apprentice, an apprentice glass bo- blower, a glass blower, and uh, he was a railroad worker. So uh, this guy. He did not exactly uh, have the quickest upbringing in baseball. He was doing very normal people work, but he had some talents. And uh, according to Society of American Baseball Research, uh, in his spare time, he played a kind of baseball using cork stoppers in wool socks wrapped in black tape. And the fence pickets were when bats uh, were 
weren't weren't available. Okay, so they used fence pickets when they didn't have bats. So they played a very very improvised game of baseball, and he didn't play organized ball until he was 19 years old, which is uh, one year younger than Chris and I both are. So he was right around our age getting started, and he played his first time pitching was for an organized team, and he struck out 15 batters and walked two in seven innings, which is uh, very impressive, it's fair, especially for especially for the dead ball era. You don't see strikeouts in that time. Yeah. And uh, one of his coaches said, quote, Bob's best game was a postseason series against the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad teams uh, in Cumberland and the big team around here. That's what they are. We went down there with Bobby and he held, he held them hitless, fanned, he held them hitless, he fanned 18 batters, and the only man to reach first eventually got around to third. The reason he got there was because Bobby told me he let them steal second and third because he was so sure he could fan the next batters and the runner wouldn't steal home. The score was one to nothing, the other pitcher allowing just one hit, which is, I mean, I would love to see a game like that in the majors where like it's a one nothing game, one hit total. And the only guy that reaches first, the pitcher just allows them second and third because they aren't they aren't scoring. No one's getting him in a position to score. And the B and O team, which he played for, uh, wanted him after this. But eventually, he uh, Grove was working for B and O, but he didn't play for them. But he was offered one hundred twenty five dollars a month contract with a Class D team in Martinsburg, West Virginia. And when with his, with his parents' permission, he took a 30-day leave from his job and took a railroad pass in a car that was supplied by his former team. So this guy had a very, very unorthodox way of breaking into the majors, but nonetheless, he did it. And now he is in the minor leagues. Yeah, um, Lefty Grove, very blue-collar upbringing up in uh, Lona Conning, Maryland. And it's funny to imagine him just in a random railroad car just like, oh, yeah, drop me off at this place, at this, you know, abandoned baseball field for this uh, West Virginia minor league team. So Lefty Grove started his minor league career in Martinsburg, West Virginia, made a very good impression, had a 1.68 ERA and 60 strikeouts in 59 innings pitch for Martinsburg in the year 1920. First year of the live ball era. I, I wonder if it hit Martinsburg uh, mm-hmm. uh, Grove so and uh, word got out to the owner of the Baltimore Orioles Jack Dunn uh, word got out to the owner of the Baltimore Orioles who was Jack Dunn and uh, the Orioles were of the International League uh, of another minor league team and uh, Jack Dunn the owner sent uh, sent his son to watch Mr. Grove play and meanwhile, uh, Martinsburg was playing on the road for their whole season because they did not have a fence. And so they sold Grove's contract to the Orioles for between $3,000 and $3,500. And Grove later said, I was the only player ever traded for a fence. So Martinsburg needed a fence. The Orioles needed a pitcher. So a solid exchange uh, there. And by some accounts, the Orioles signed Groves just before the New York Giants, Detroit Tigers, and Brooklyn Dodgers uh, were going to offer more for him. Uh, Grove could have been, could have very well been a major leaguer, you know, at the age of 20. Uh, And after Grove uh, started and won his first game, uh, Orioles owner Jack Dunn said that he wouldn't sell Grove for $10,000, um, which is a tall price for, uh, for a young pitcher like Grove. And in Grove's first full season with the Orioles, he went 25-10 and 10 and posted a 2.56 ERA and 313 innings pitched. And he played fr- uh, with the Orioles from the middle of 1920 through 1924, and he went 108 and 36. That's a 100, 108 and 36 record with a 2.96 ERA in 1,184 innings and 1,108 strikeouts. His 1,108 1, strikeouts were a minor league record at the time. And uh, Grove had matured a lot 
by 1924. Uh, he had matured a lot by 1984, uh, 1924, uh, reducing his number of walks from 186 to 108 in that season. And when the Orioles uh, played major league teams in preseason exhibitions, Grove routinely struck out uh, 10 plus batters in those games, which is a very big deal considering that the, uh, that the trend of strikeouts had definitely not hit baseball by then. That's hard to do now even. And at one point, Lefty Grove told Babe Ruth in an exhibition game, quote, quote unquote, I'm not afraid of you. And he backed that up by striking him out nine times and 11 at bats in those exhibition games. That's how you do it. That's, that's a major, that's, that's a big, uh, big show moment for, for a guy who's not even in the majors quite yet. And after the 1924 season, Orioles owner Jack Dunn gave in to selling Grove's contract, knowing what his value was. Uh, the Cubs and Dodgers offered one hundred thousand dollars, but uh, Dunn took up took up on the offer of old friend Connie Mack, who was the owner of the Philadelphia Athletics, and uh, he ended up paying a hundred thousand dollars, a hundred thousand six hundred dollars for Lefty Grove. So now Grove is officially in Major League Baseball. That's right. And he gets a wild one for a start in 1925. So he got the start for each of his first three appearances, uh, throwing 15 innings, walking 15 batters, and allowing 11 earned runs. So not a very good start for Lefty Grove, but he can only go up from there. And after that, he, he served as a reliever. Uh, he relieved 27 games and started 12. And overall in the 19... 19- 25 season he ended up with a 475 era a 473 fip a 98 era plus and six walks per nine so obviously the, the walks are a big issue he led the league in strikeouts however with 116 and k's per nine with 5.3 that's like terrible in this in this day and age so how far we've come in 100 years uh, he also led the league in walks with 131 and his 1.72 whip was the second worst among qualifiers and his six walks per nine was the worst and athletics catcher mickey mickey cochran who's come up a few times on this show uh, when talking about grove in 1925 said quote catching him was like catching bullets with a rifleman from a rifleman with a bad arm or with bad aim sorry um and so with this 1925 season uh grove focused on being able to control the baseball in the offseason saying quote Huh, so I'm the wild guy of the league. I'll show him something next year. See that chalk mark on the barn door? I'm measured off 60 feet. I reckon I reckon it is. And at six o'clock every morning, I hit the chalk mark 20 times before I quit. Then I tramp the hills hunting and cover about 20 miles a day. This is the most 1920s thing I've ever heard. Yeah, that's... uh. <laughs> they don't make them like this anymore. Yeah, Lefty Grove... Uh, he did rather than rather than uh, you know going to drive line and using rap soto to focus on his spin rate and his spin axis <laughs> uh, he just marked off some chalk on a on the side of a barn tried to hit it 20 times and then he went hunting for the rest of the day so there's so that's lefty grove's p- path to um path to maybe you know maybe Robbie Ray can can benefit from this seriously Robbie Ray is I mean Robbie Ray's entire career is has been like uh Lefty Grove's 1925 season so maybe maybe he can learn a little bit from this yeah Robbie Ray you know if you 12 want to... strikeouts per nine since uh since 2017 but also uh four walks per nine yeah so Robbie Ray if you if you want to get your control down get your command down as well uh, put put some chalk on the on a side of a barn, hit that chalk from sixty feet away, uh, 20, 20 times every day. And uh, do they do they have barns in Canada? Um, I feel like I feel like that is a very like American stereotype. Um, they I, have to obviously. I mean, it's they, yeah, they must. They, there's they no must. way like civilization could survive without like farming and barns and stuff like that. 
Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, maybe he'll have to he'll have to find somewhere. You know, yeah. maybe maybe we're focusing on the wrong things here. He can he can become a Hall of Famer with these uh with these steps. It's got to be a barn though. It can't it has, be anything yes. else. Yes, that's true. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> um, so now we get into Lefty Groves' uh three year era where it's a quick right of the ship. You know, it's not really a long development process for him to become an elite pitcher. This is from 1926 to 1928. So Grove in 1926 started 33 games and relieved just 12 and his walks per nine dropped from all the way up to six, all the way down to 3.5. He finished sixth in innings pitched with 258. He led the league in hits per nine with 7.9 strikeouts with 194 strikeouts per nine with 6.8 strikeout to walk ratio with 1.92 FIP with a 2.96, ERA with a 2.51, and ERA plus with a 165. He also converted six saves and seven opportunities, so he was doing everything he could when he was called on. He finished second in the league in B-War and led the league in F-War, and he also finished eighth in the MVP vote. And Lefty Grove's 1926 is the only season by a pitcher in their first two seasons with 20 plus complete games and six plus saves. How about that? Uh, Groves 1926 is also the only season in the live ball era with 190 plus strikeouts, less than 105 walks, and less than seven home runs allowed. How about that? Uh, and the, as far as the athletics went, uh, they were kind of beginning their, uh, Uh, rise you know kind of at the infancy they went 83 and 67 very respectable finishing third in the american league so lefty grove kind of continued on his own way in 1927 he started 28 games and relieved 23 so he's so he is becoming more of a starter now and his walks per nine went from 3.5 down to 2.7 so in just you know over the course of three seasons it's gone from six to 2.7 he has cut it in half and even more so he also converted nine out of 10 save opportunities and he finished fourth in innings pitched with 262 and a third ninth in ERA with a 319 second in FIP with a 292 and eighth in ERA plus with a three with a 132. And he led the league in strikeouts with 174 and case per nine with six flat. He finished fifth in B war and led the league in F war. Uh, and it is the only season in the live ball era with 170 plus strikeouts, less than 80 walks, and less than seven home runs allowed. So Lefty Grove already uh, dominating the strikeout to walk ratio just years after it couldn't have been any worse. And the Athletics went 91 and 63. They finished second in the American League. So unfortunately, they couldn't make the playoffs. Yeah, they had a uh, a particular a particular team with pinstripes yeah. in their way. Yep. That year. Uh, no one was getting close, but a very, very good record. Very respectable uh, second place team. Maybe if they had playoffs, they'd uh, they'd get into those playoffs. But nope. Old school, old school baseball. One one out of eight teams gets into the playoffs. And uh, Grove continues his uh, dominance in 1928. Uh, he started 31 games and relieved only eight. Uh, he finished sixth in innings pitched with 261 and two thirds innings pitched, third in ERA with a 2.58, and second in ERA plus with 155. Uh, he led the league in wins with 24 strikeouts with 183 and strikeout to walk ratio with 2.86. And Grove also led the league in both B War and F War. But unfortunately, against the biggest competitors, he kind of failed to rise to the occasion. Uh, against the Yankees, he went one and six with a 5.44 ERA. Against teams that weren't the Yankees, he went 23 and two with a 2.00 ERA. So there's two, two things you can take away from that. He was excellent 
against you know the regular teams, but against the best teams, he uh, against the best team, he did not necessarily rise to the occasion, and unfortunately, uh, that played a role in uh, the Athletics not making the World Series. They went 98 and 55, a very good record, but they finished two and a half games behind the pennant winning Yankees. So uh, a very good year from Lefty Grove, but a lot left still to be desired. But now we get into the era of the A's and Lefty Grove, where both the A's are dominating and Lefty Grove is dominating, and they kind of go hand in hand here. A three-year period um, where they are just dominating the league. So in 1929, on May 1st, uh, Grove threw five innings and allowed two runs to get the win over the Red Sox. And the next day, he was called upon to get another start, and he threw a complete game where he allowed no runs and struck out nine. So that was uh, that was his role in 1929, just doing doing whatever he could. I guess his arm felt fine after five strong against the Red Sox. Good enough. Good enough to throw a complete game the very next day. <clears throat> and uh, through July 20th in 1929, he had a 16 and two record with a 1.95 ERA and a 2.7 strikeout to walk ratio and 171 innings pitch. And on August 14th, Grove threw 17 innings, allowing 20 hits, four walks, three runs, and two earned runs, and got the win. And this is just a, a fun thing, not really just an not really an impressive thing, but pretty pretty funny to point out. This game, this August 14th game, remains the only start uh, with 20 plus hits allowed and one plus walk to get the win. How about that? Uh, and Grove ended up uh, starting a career high 37 games in 1929, and he relieved five games as well. Uh, he led the league in starts winning percentage with a 769. He had a 20 and six record to provide that 769 winning percentage. He also led the league in strikeouts with 170. Strikeouts per nine with 5.6, strikeout to walk ratio with 2.1, FIP with 3.22, ERA with a 2.81, and ERA plus with a 149. And Grove finished second in B War and led the league in F War. And the Athletics finally broke the threshold. They went 104 and 46 and won the pennant by an 18 game margin. So now, the Athletics and Lefty Grove are in the Fall Classic. And manager Connie Mack feared how Lefty Grove and other lefties on the Athletics pitching staff would fare against the mostly right-handed Cubs. So, unfortunately for Grove, Grove did not get any starts. Uh, but he got some relief in. He got some relief innings. In Game 2... After the starter allowed three runs in the fifth inning, Grove came into a 6-3 to three game with two outs and men on first and second and the tying run at the plate. Uh, Grove struck that batter out, and he struck out the next two after that in the sixth inning. And Grove, in that appearance, retired the first eight batters he saw and ended up throwing a four and a third innings pitched, allowing three hits, no runs, no walks, and striking out six while earning the save in game two of the World Series. And in game four, after the Athletics scored 10 runs in the seventh inning to take a 10 to 8 lead, uh, Grove came into the game for a six out save where he retired all six batters and he struck out four. Just pure dominance uh, in an era where dominant pitching was not really common. So Grove, with these two performances, is the only pitcher in baseball history to have four plus strikeouts, allow four or few, four or fewer base runners, and allow no runs in each of his first two World Series appearances. How about that? And 
This gave the A's a 3-1 to one series lead, and they won Game 5, making Grove a World Series champion. And some off-the-field stuff after the 1929 season. Uh, Connie Mack convinced Grove to move his money to another bank, uh, and that helped Grove keep his money during the Great Depression, um, which you know muddled so many people uh, back in 1929. And he eventually, with this money, built Lefty's Place, uh, a, a place called Lefty's Place, in his hometown of Lona Coney, Maryland, which had three bowling alleys, a pool table, and refreshments to go to go with that. And that is where he employed his brother, Dewey, who was actually out of work uh, since the factory he worked at burned down. Uh, and he also employed his physically challenged brother-in-law. So, you know, you could tell Grove was very gracious and, uh, you know, thought about thought about the people close to him, uh, you know, keeping keeping his money, building something, employing people who needed to be employed. That's just kind of a sneak peek at uh, what he did off the field. But now yeah. we get into uh, the season of offense, but not really when you not really when you phase Lefty Grove. Yeah, uh, Lefty Grove, noted good guy. But we turned the decade to the 30s, and he started 32 games in this season and relieved 18. Then he ended up finishing fourth in innings pitch with 291. He led the league in appearances with 50, saves with nine, which is pretty hilarious, wins yeah. with 28. How, how often does someone win, lead the league in wins and saves in the same season? Uh, that's a good question. It's Never. Hard, hard to find that out. I, I would guess he's the only person to do that. It is hard to find out, though. Uh, winning percentage with an 848, strikeouts with 209, case per nine with 6.5, a whip of 1.14, K to walk ratio of 3.48, FIP of 309, ERA of 2.54, and an ERA plus of 185. No other pitcher was within 2B war or F war of him during the season of offense. It is also the only season in the live ball era that is since 1920 with 290 plus innings pitched, a 3.4 plus K to walk ratio, and less than 0.3 home runs per nine. It is the only season in baseball history with 20 plus complete games and nine plus saves and an ERA of ERA plus of 150 or higher. His 1930 has the fifth highest win probability added by a pitcher in a single season. And the athletics went 102 and 52 and won the American league. So lefty Grove had another chance at a world series title. He got his first, World Series start in game one, where he allowed two runs in a complete game, five to two victory over the Cardinals. And in game four, with the Athletics up 3-0 in the series, Grove allowed three runs, which one of them being earned, and in eight innings, but got the loss in a three to one deficit. The next day in game five, he came into a 0-0 ball game at the beginning of the eighth inning, and he allowed a single in the eighth. The Athletics scored two runs on a Jimmy Fox home run in the top of the ninth, and Grove got the final three outs, giving him his second World Series championship. Throughout the series, Grove had a 1.42 ERA in 19 innings pitched. Very impressive. And now we get into uh, Grove's, you know, this is the uh, the banner season of, of his career. 1931 uh, is a season that is very associated with Lefty Grove. So he started 30 games and he relieved 11. He finished second in innings pitch with 280, 288 and two thirds innings pitched. Uh, he led the league in wins with 31. No one else that year had more than 22 and Lefty Grove had 31. So a testament to both his pitching and the Philadelphia Athletics dominance. Uh, Grove also led the league in winnings per, winning percentage with an 886 winning percentage. Complete games with 27, shutouts with four, led the league in strikeouts with 175, whip with a 1.08, strikeout to walk ratio with a 2.8, FIP with a 3.01, ERA with a 2.06, and ERA plus with a 217 ERA plus, 117% above league average. Or better, better than league average, I guess. You know, wording can be weird when it comes to run prevention. But no one in the MLB was within two F war 
or four B war of no one was with, within that of Lefty Grove in 1931. And in its first year, in its current modern form, uh, Lefty Grove won American League MVP. And his 886 winning percentage remains the highest in a single season with 30 plus decisions since 1875. And his win probability added in 1931 remains the highest in a single season by a pitcher since win probability added started being recorded in 1916. And uh, Grove's 1930 and 1931 seasons are the only seasons in the live ball era with 280 plus, 280 plus innings pitched, 10 or fewer home runs allowed, 175 plus strikeouts, and less than 65 walks. How about that? His 1931 is also the only season in the live ball era with 31 plus wins and five plus saves. Uh, his 1931 is also the only season in the live ball era with 280 plus innings pitch, 10 or fewer home runs allowed, and an ERA plus of 210 or better. How about that? It is also the only season in baseball history with 30 plus wins and less than five losses. How about that? And it is the only season in baseball history with 280 plus innings pitched five plus saves and an ERA plus of 200 or better. How about that? And uh, Grove's six seasons with 170 plus strikeouts and 10 or fewer home runs allowed up to this point remain the most such seasons through a pitcher's first seven seasons. How about that? And the athletics went 107 and 45 and won the American League by a 13 and a half game margin, bringing winning them their third AL pennant, getting them to their third consecutive World Series. So in game one, Grove got the ball. And after giving up two runs in the first inning, he went eight shutout innings and held the Cardinals to go in 0 for 6 with runners in scoring position and he earned the win in a 6 to 2 victory. And according to uh, this is a quote from Society of American Baseball Research. With a blister on a throwing finger, Grove yielded 12 hits in the series opener, but got good fielding support and won 6-2. Uh, quote, Nah, the blister didn't hurt, said Grove, who had to rely on curves and slow balls. But them dinky hits they got made me, uh, those dinky hits they made got me mad. I started thinking my control was too good. You know, I was putting them right over the plate. I started thinking, and you know what happens when a left-hander gets to thinking. Well, I began to chuck up slow ones in a little curve. Every time I tossed one, the cards got a, got a hold of it. From now on, they won't see nothing but fastball pitching. So there was a, a little insight to what lefty what was going on with Lefty Grove. Did he publicly say that after that start going forward? Um... I don't know if this was uh I don't know when this was said. I don't know if it was in a post game thing or if it was years later. Yeah, because it'd, it'd be kind of funny if he was like, Yeah, don't expect curveballs anymore going forward, just letting you know. Yeah, that would be pretty uh insane to say. But <laughs> I don't know. If if you didn't have a copy of the, that that newspaper, maybe maybe the Cardinals just never yeah. got it. <laughs> I don't know. Didn't get delivered to their to their place. Yeah, maybe it was just a Philadelphia only one. Um, but uh, with the 1931 World Series, Game Three was delayed by one day due due to rain, and uh, due to this, Grove had enough rest to pitch in Game Three. You know, normally he would have pitched Game One, Game Four. In Game Three, with the series tied one one. Uh, Grove allowed four runs in eight innings and got the loss in a five to two defeat. And then in game six, with the Athletics facing elimination, he allowed only one run and six base runners in a complete game win, where the A's won eight to one. He saved saved the season, but unfortunately, the A's lost game seven, 
and that denied them and Grove of their third straight title. And Grove was very impressive throughout the series, you know, in terms of combined statistics. Had a 2.42 ERA and 26 innings pitch. He had 16 strikeouts, two walks, and no home runs in that 1931 World Series. And then when you add on top of it, his entire World Series resume from 1929 to 1931, uh, his uh, career World Series statistics uh, in from 1929 to 31, he had a 1.75 ERA and 51 in the third innings pitch, 36 strikeouts, six walks, no home runs in 51 in the third innings pitch. He also had a four and two record and two saves to go along with that. So he was dominant in the postseason in a in an era of offense. So now the A's dynasty is just about over, but Lefty Grove is still doing his thing. In 1932, he started 30 games and relieved 14. He finished second in innings pitch with 291 and two thirds innings. He led the league in complete games with 27, shutouts with four, whip with a 1.19, K to walk ratio with a 2.4, FIP with a 3.13, ERA with a 2.84, and ERA plus with a 1.60. He led the league in B war and F war. He finished 14th in the MVP vote, and it is the only season in the live ball era with 26 plus complete games, seven plus saves and an ERA of less than three. His seven seasons with 255 plus innings pitched and five plus Ks per nine up to this point remain the most such seasons through a pitcher's first eight seasons. And the A's finished 94 and 60, still very good, but not good enough. Second in the AL, no playoffs. And after the season with Connie Mack struggling to pay salary through the Great Depression, the A's sold the rights to future haulers Al Simmons and two other players, which was beginning, which is the beginning of the end of the dynasty. So in 1933, uh, we're kind of wrapping up on uh, Lefty Grove's time in Philadelphia. He started 28 games and relieved 17, finished third in innings pitch with 275 and a third. Second in FIP with a 3.48, fourth in ERA with a 3.20, and third in ERA plus with a 134. So even when he's not the best in the league, he uh, he is top three in general, and he led the league in wins. Led the league in wins with 24, uh, winning percentage with a with 750, and complete games with 21, and he finished fifth in the MVP vote and his 1933 remains the only season by a pitcher in their age 33 season or older with 24 plus wins less than 10 losses and six plus saves How about that? and his 68.4 career B war and 195 career wins up to this point Remain the most in the live ball era through a pitcher's first nine seasons. How about that? And uh, Grove's eight qualifying seasons with an ERA plus of 130 or better up to this point remain the most through a pitcher's first nine seasons. How about that? Uh, however, in 1933, his strikeouts per nine dropped from 5.8 to 3.7. And he finished outside the top 10 in strikeouts per nine for the first time in his career. So his arm was not quite the same as it was when he was starting his career. And this kind of caps off a dominant era of Lefty Grove, particular dominance here. Uh, from 1926 to 1933, he averaged 23 wins, 22 complete games, six saves, a 2.71 ERA, 3.07 FIP, 160 ERA plus, 276 innings pitched, and 8.3 B war per year in a seven year, eight year span. And from 1926 to 1933, he led all of Major League Baseball in wins, complete games, innings, strikeouts, B war, and F war. And he led in ERA and FIP minimum 700 innings pitched, a little less than you know, in that eight-year span, needed about 90 innings per year. 
so not I was gonna say I think he had no problem getting to 700 yeah he uh he pitched a little over 2000 I think yeah. in that <laughs> in that eight year span and his b war from 1926 to 1933 was 75% higher than any other pitcher in Major League Baseball. He was almost double the next best pitcher, you know, the number two pitcher in Major League Baseball. And in 1933, the Athletics uh, went 79 and 72 and finished third in the American League. And after the season, he was traded along with Max, uh, Max Bishop and Rube Wahlberg to the Boston Red Sox for uh, Bob Klein, Rabbit, uh, Rabbit Worsler, and one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars, which was the main kicker. So now, Lefty Grove is pitching as a member of the Boston Red Sox. So, Lefty Grove is now in Boston, and unfortunately, he does not make a great first impression on the Fenway faithful. After being after being looked at as a potential team savior. He developed a sore arm in mid-March, and he didn't appear in a game until the team's 15th game. And in his first appearance, he allowed three hits and walked two batters without getting an out. He ended up throwing, throwing only 109 in the third innings pitched on the year, posting a 650 ERA, 73 ERA plus with 12.3 hits per nine. Even with this season, though, he is still the only pitcher in the modern era to accumulate 200 wins while having less than 100 losses, through their first 10 seasons. So Lefty Grove, not a very good year in 1934, but he would look to uh, salvage uh, a better reputation in Boston in the rest of his, in the rest of his time there. Yeah. uh, And in this era, the last, the last five years of the thirties, or I guess the second half of the, of the thirties. And it's kind of funny because uh, he was born in 1900. So, his his thirties were the nineteen thirties, similar to us. Um, so he was back. To, he kind of went back to normal in his late thirties, in the late nineteen thirties. Uh, kind of after a after a blip in the radar in nineteen thirty four, change changes back. So and it's thanks to some adjustments as well. Clearly, he was not the same pitcher in terms of strikeouts. So a uh, quote from society of american baseball research says the curve became his major out pitch grove explained because he had lost his fastball i was actually too fast to curve the ball well with baltimore and philadelphia a little humble brag there he said the ball didn't have enough time to break because i threw what passed for a curve as fast as i threw my fastball i couldn't get enough twist on it now that i'm not so fast I can really break one off and my fastball looks faster than it is because it's faster than the other stuff I throw. He paused and added, a pitcher has t- has time enough to get smarter after he loses his speed. So this is kind of a, uh, a, a resurgence for Lefty Grove. He kind of changes his pitching style, adjusts to his body, and he gets back to his regular dominant self. And his career ground out to air out ratio from uh, before the 1935 season was 0.98. Uh, then in 1935, he had a 1.27 ground out to air out ratio. So he was more apt to getting the ground ball, um, which was very key for a guy with lower velocity, making it, you know, making it uh, more easy to, get outs for himself and in 1935 he finished sixth in innings pitch with 273 and despite finishing only eighth in strikeouts per nine he led the league in whip with a 1.22 also led the league in fip which is surprising considering he was not up not very up there with the strikeout numbers led the league in fip with a 3.20 led the league in era with a 2.70 and led the league in era plus with a 175. So even without these strikeouts, he was still able to dominate. Uh, and Grove led the league in both B war and F war in 1935. And he finished 14th in the MVP vote. And his 1935 remains the only season in the live ball era by a pitcher in their age 35 season or older 
with 270 plus innings pitched, 65 or fewer walks, and six or few six or fewer home runs allowed. So now we go into 1936, and he looks to continue his path. He started 35, 30 games that year and relieved in five. And he finished sixth in innings pitch with 253 and a third, and second in FIP with a 377. He led the league in shutouts with six, whip with 119, strikeout to walk ratio with a two flat, ERA with a 281, and ERA plus with a 189. He led the league in B war and finished second in F war. And his 1936 has the highest B-war in a season by their by a pitcher in their age 36 season or older with 11.2. And it is also the only season by a pitcher in their age 36 season or older with a with five plus shutouts and an ERA plus of 180 or higher. So Grove definitely um, excellent into his into his late 30s and in 1937 he started 32 games and relieved zero games so he was permanently just a starter they were not calling him on to relieve any games and grove actually kind of uh got back to where he was in terms of strikeouts he had five plus strikeouts per nine for the first time in five years and he finished top five in strikeouts per nine for the first time in five years as well. And he finished fifth in innings pitched that year with 262, second in FIP with a 3.28, fifth in ERA with a 3.02, and fourth in ERA plus with a 159. Uh, With this, he led the league in both B-War and F-War, and he finished 15th in the MVP vote. And his 1937 has the fifth highest B-War by a pitcher in their age 37 season or older with a 9.8 with 9.8 baseball reference wins above replacement, fifth highest by uh, a pitcher in their age 37 season or older. And his six seasons with nine plus B-War from his age 30 season on are the most such seasons. How about that? So no one quite did it like Grove did after turning 30 in terms of getting nine win seasons. And it is the only season since 1920 by a pitcher in their age 37 or older, uh, in their age 37 season or older, uh, with 261 plus innings pitched, a 1.8 plus strikeout to walk ratio, and less than 0.35 home runs per nine. And Grove's 1937 is the only season by a pitcher uh, in the live ball era by a pitcher in their age 37 season or older with 20 plus complete games, less than 85 walks, and less than 10 home runs allowed. How about that? So Lefty Grove's 1938 season wasn't super active. He threw 98.1 less innings than he did in 37 but there was still enough to qualify him to be a, a rate stat leader. And he led the league in winning percentage with a 778. That would be a 14 and four record. He led in K to walk ratio with a 1.9 FIP with a 3.32 ERA with a 3.08 and ERA plus with a 160. This gave him fourth and F fourth and B war and sixth and F war, despite barely qualifying and 21st in the MVP vote. And on to Lefty Groves. Last great season, 1939, where he threw uh, 191 innings pitch, so a little more than 25 more than he did in 1938, but still not up there when he was a when he was a younger pitcher. Uh, he finished fourth in fielding independent pitching, FIP as you may know it, with a 3.60. Led the league once again in ERA with a 2.54. And led the league in ERA plus with a 185 ERA plus. And it is the only season in the live ball era by a pitcher in their age 39 season or older with 190 plus innings pitched, less than 10 home runs allowed, and an ERA plus of 180 or better. How about that? And this caps off Grove's sort of second era of dominance where he's in Boston, he's in his late 30s. 
And from 1935 to 1939, he had 37 more ERA plus than anyone else with 200 plus innings pitched from 1935 to 39. So 37% better. And also, he probably didn't have any problem getting to 200 innings pitched in that time. Yeah, exactly. Getting 262 uh, in 1937 alone. Yeah, he was throwing a, a more than a thousand, and that that minimum is at 200 plus innings. So that's yeah. not cherry picked at all. Definitely not. And Grove had also been, you know, 37 percent better in terms of ERA plus. He had 72 percent more B WAR than any other pitcher in Major League Baseball from 1935 to 1939. And his eight qualifying seasons with an ERA plus of 155 or better from his age 30 season on are the most such seasons. How about that? And his 110.5 career B war and 286 career wins up to this point remain the most in the live ball era through a pitcher's first 15 seasons. So now we switch the decade once again, and Lefty Grove is going for a milestone, his 300th career win. In 1940, despite a drop in innings pitched, he still managed to bring two different starts to the 13th inning, which is insane. His, 19, his 1940 season remains the only in the live ball era by a pitcher 40 or older with multiple games with 12.1 innings pitched. That season, he put up a 3.99 ERA, but he got quite lucky as he had a 4.72 FIP, a 112 ERA, and 153 and a third innings pitched. But more importantly, he won seven games, which put him just seven away from 300. And now on to 1941, the finale. Uh, Grove went 6-2 and two with a 3.87 ERA through his first 12 starts. And in his next two starts... He allowed two earned runs each in complete games. Seemingly, that's usually a a uh, a performance that you know two earned runs in a complete game that'll usually get you the win. But he got the loss in each of those games. And in the start after those two disappointments, on July 25th, uh, manager Joe Cronin told Grove, uh, "Pop, this is a nine inning game. I'm not coming out to get you." So this is Grove's Grove's game to win. Unfortunately, he allowed six runs, five of them being earned through his first seven innings of that game, and the Red Sox were losing six to four. But the Red Sox tied it in the seventh. Grove went one, two, three in the top of the eighth. And then Grove's best friend in baseball, Jimmy Fox, who had been teammates with him both in Philadelphia and Boston for many, many years up to that point, uh, that man hit a triple that brought in three runs in the bottom of the eighth. And then Grove went one, two, three in the ninth, which gave him his milestone 300th win. And it had been 15 years uh, since a pitcher got their 300th win. And it wouldn't be another 20 years until another pitcher got their 300th win. So Grove was clearly you know, really one of the only great pitchers of this, uh, of this era. And in his following three starts, he put up a six, five, five ERA in 22 innings pitched. And after those three starts, uh, he did not put together a start longer than one inning. And he ended up with a four, three, seven ERA three, six, two FIP and 95 ERA plus in 134 innings in 1941 and after the season in early December while walking with Red Sox owner Tom Yawkey on his hunting reserve Grove told Yawkey that he was going to retire and uh, his retirement was buried in the news with the Japanese attacking Pearl Harbor around that same time so no one was really itching for for lefty Grove news at the time I probably would have been yeah me too <laughs> But oh well, I guess that's just us. So now Lefty Grove has retired just after getting that milestone 300th win. 
And in his post-career, he was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1947, certainly deservingly so. And 13 years after his induction, he received six votes in the 1960 Baseball Hall of Fame vote. Uh, someone, six people weren't, weren't in on the news. Yeah, you could, you could, uh, what? It basically, you, it was all write-ins, I think. And, uh, I guess people forgot that Lefty Grove was in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> I can't wait to vote for Barry Larkin next year. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> it's, I've, that's wild to me. That's, that's, that's a summary of the BBWA voters right there. Yeah. <laughs> and he lived about a regular life until he died. Uh, later at the age of 75. Yes. And his, as far as his all-time ranks go, he, his eight times leading the league in FIP are third most in baseball history. Uh, his five times leading the league in winning percentage and nine times leading the league in ERA plus are the most of such times in baseball history. Yeah. And, la- and also his eight times leading the league in pitcher B-War are the most of such times in baseball history. Also, his nine ERA titles are most all time. No one else has led ERA more. And he led the league in win probability added nine times. No other pitcher in baseball history has led that stat more than five times. He did at nine. His 300 career wins ranked 23rd of all time. His 680 career winning percentage ranks ninth. His 148 ERA plus ranks sixth. His 888 career pitcher B war F war ranks 13th, and his 113.3 career B war ranks sixth. He is also the all-time leader in pitcher B war among left-handed pitchers, being that his name is Lefty Grove. He is the also the all-time leader in winning percentage among pitchers with 350 plus decisions. He is also the all-time leader in ERA plus among in- pitchers with over 3,000 innings pitched. And last but not least. With no minimums, he is the all-time leader among pitchers in win probability added. Not even some some cheap guy with one game got more. Yes, that is a uh, lefty grow. But yeah, that's it is something you uh, accumulate. But he was all-time leader in, in win probability added. Yeah. Um, over over his career, I say and, that is a count statistic. And he does not. Um, you know, he kind of gets he kind of gets lost in history, but he does all, all time leader and win probability added. And now we're going to get into the Lefty Grove edition of how about that? career edition. You know, we have the how about that button ready throughout the show. But this is a segment dedicated entirely to those uh, to those things. So he had. Lefty Grove had eight seasons with 250 plus innings pitched and 10 or fewer home runs allowed. No one else in the live ball era has more than five such seasons. How about that? And Lefty Grove's five seasons with 20 plus game, 20 plus complete games and five plus saves are the most such seasons in baseball history. How about that? So no one, no one was quite. No one was quite the hybrid that Lefty Grove was, both starting and relieving. Grove also, his seven seasons with a 750 winning percentage are the most such seasons in baseball history. How about that? And Grove also had five seasons with 24 plus wins and 10 or fewer losses. No one else in baseball history has more than three such seasons. Grove also had 10 qualifying seasons with an ERA plus of 150 or better. And those are the most such seasons in baseball history. How about that? And Grove is the only pitcher in baseball history with 100 plus B war and less than 4,000 innings pitched. How about that? So he got that. Got that wins above replacement in a timely manner. <clears throat> and lastly, uh, Grove is the only pitcher in baseball history with 300 plus wins and less than 150 losses. How about that? So there you go for for Lefty Grove. 
and his uh, career. How about that's one of the best to ever do it. And there's yeah. not a lot of talk about him. And on to Lefty Grove's legacy. Uh, first of all, what I'll say, Lefty Grove was a fantastic postseason performer in the three World Series he performed in. And because of that, he is a two-time World Series champion. He was a big part of those World Series championships, you know. Uh, 51 and a third innings pitched, no home runs. You know, this is also the live ball era. No home runs in 50-plus innings and a 175 ERA, uh, a six strikeout to walk ratio. He really turned it up, really turned it up when he, when it mattered most in, in the World Series. Also, uh, Lefty Grove was the first great pitcher to start his career in the live ball era. You know, this was a time where offense was – was uh was crazy you know we've had we've talked about rogers hornsby and uh jimmy, jimmy fox. fox his own teammate jimmy fox yeah jimmy fox lou gehrig guys that you know started their career um or flourished in the 20s and 30s and you know were able to set you know ops records crazy numbers you know the league average ops was closer to closer to 800 than it was 700 so you know pitching there weren't a lot of great pitchers lefty grove was uh was one of those great pitchers and i would say it is arguable that no one was above the rest of their league in their era the same way grove was in the late 1920s and 1930s in other words like you know when in the dead ball era, there were, you know, Walter Johnson was the best, but there were guys, there were guys, you know, that could be considered somewhat close to him. Like, you know, Pete Alexander, you know, at the beginning of Johnson's career, there was Christy Mathewson and guys like that. And, you know, in the, in, you know, to, uh, today or right before, um, right before this era, there was, you know, Greg Maddox and Randy, Randy Johnson, no one was really clearly that above, above and beyond the rest of the competition. Lefty Grove was so far and so far above and beyond the rest of everybody else. Like the, the next best pitcher of his era was probably uh, a guy, Carl Hubble, and he ended up with like less than 70 B war. Grove was just way better. You know, we, we mentioned some of those eras, five year spans where he had 75% more B war than the next best pitcher. It was a uh, crazy, you know, when you think of, if you think of a late twenties, early thirties pitcher, you're thinking about lefty Grove for sure. Um, also uh, Grove's ERA title record, 148 career ERA plus and 680 career winning percentage provides an argument for him. For him being statistically the most dominant pitcher ever, there's there's an argument to be made that because of his ERA plus being you know career wise 48 percent above average, and you know winning at a very very high rate, he's one of the most dominant to ever do it. He didn't have a crazy long career, didn't have you know 5,000 innings pitch, but uh, he was very dominant in the years he did pitch in Major League Baseball. And statistically speaking, you know, if you take out errors and, and what have you, all that bias, statistically, pen to paper, greatest left-handed pitcher of all time in terms of, uh, you know, winning all those ERA titles, having a fantastic ERA plus, you know, led the league in strikeout seven times to go along with that, um, you know, 300 wins, less than 150 losses, I know. You know, it's not the best marker, but for a career, it's hard to get lucky like that. He was, uh, he was great. St statistically speaking, um, just on, on the reference page, the greatest left-handed pitcher of all time. So that's, that's what I have on, uh, on Lefty Grove. When you say best pitcher of all time, I think, I mean, I'm not, obviously I said last week, Lefty Grove is, you know, arguably the best pitcher of all time, but I think best pitcher of all time and most dominating pitcher of all time are two separate things. And I think without a doubt, Lefty Grove is probably the most dominant pitcher of all time. I mean, he was doing this when pitchers weren't supposed to do that. I mean, 185 ERA plus multiple times. 
that's not normal. No one, no one does that. And he was the only one that was doing it in the twenties and thirties. Yeah, absolutely. And not only that, but sorry to interrupt, but he go, I mean, he had quite the glow up. I mean, he goes from working in coal mines uh, and then being traded for a fence to being arguably the greatest pitcher of all time. That's something that's very underrated. Yeah, that is uh that is a good point. You know, these guys, these guys have some some good stories for sure. At least, at least when Randy Johnson was traded, he got you know the other teams got real players in return. This Lefty Grove was traded for a fence. Yeah, he was. He was. Uh, vir- virtually, yes, that is the uh, that is the case. But yeah, um, I think I, I think I think I've gave my piece on a uh, on old Lefty Grove, and uh, I you know we hope you enjoyed. Yeah. The Lefty Grove part of episode 86. And if you uh, are listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, want to watch us talk, uh, go and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It is called Above Replacement Radio. Also, if you want to follow us on social media, give us a follow on Twitter. Follow me at Chris underscore Gianta. Follow Daniel on both Twitter and Instagram at Daniel underscore Curran. And follow our show Instagram at above replacement radio and we hope you enjoyed the and uh also we would like to thank stat head baseball reference fan graphs society of american baseball research for giving us the information we needed to make this episode possible and we hope you enjoyed the lefty grove part of the episode and we hope to see you tomorrow where we will be talking about one of our favorite time teams of all time the 2018 Boston Red Sox. See you then.